Sure. All right. Welcome to the Discovering Multifamily Podcast. I'm your host, Anthony Scandariato, and we have a very special guest today with us, uh, Elliot Horowitz with H Equities. How are you doing, Elliot? Hey, Anthony. Great. I'm doing great. How about you? Doing great. Can't complain. All right. Thanks so, for having me on. Yeah, no, absolutely. So Elliot's a managing member of H Equities uh, based out of Brooklyn. And um, from what I understand, I've known Elliot for a while. He provides uh, bridge financing for commercial properties and participates in various LPGP positions and uh, actually particularly multifamily uh, and mixed use properties, very similar to my company, Red Knight. Um, he's historically been in the boroughs of New York, um, New Jersey, and uh, South Florida. And he also is a private lender who provides uh, bridge loans and he could talk, um, talk to that, but he in general likes to um, invest in uh, value add assets in prime locations with upside. So did I get it? Did I hit the nail on the head? You got it. I think we're done. That's it. Good. <laughs> All right. Great. So, uh, so again, thanks for being here. And um, if you could kind of just talk to our listeners now, we're recording this in the midst of COVID-19 and hopefully towards the, the peak of COVID-19 in the New York metro area. Um, what have you seen um, on the financing and particularly the bridge end, which you, you specialize in? What have you seen changed in the last month? give or take. Right. So uh, like a lot, it's night and day, right? So I would start with over the last two years, I probably lost 50 different lending opportunities and I'm sort of guessing and I'm sort of rounding, it could be 70, it could be 30, but let's say 50 different lending opportunities from that were, that were provided financing by high levered, low rate bridge lenders and they're, they're all gone. They've all disappeared, right? They were reliant on um, cap rate exits that can't happen anymore. And they were reliant on other financing provided to them to lever their returns and overnight they've disappeared. So what we have now is a, a, a vacancy of, of, of that high levered uh, provider that's gone. So I'm seeing a lot of loans now where I can get better leverage and better rate. So for example, where in January and February, I had no term sheets out in the last three, four weeks, I have seven term sheets out, three of which have been signed. They're all 70 to 50% leverage, and they're all 9 to 10%. Those same loans a few months ago, even a few weeks ago, might have been 80% at 8% or 75 at 8%, right? So we're seeing that. We have a land loan we're trying to do, which will come in somewhere as around 50%, 60% leverage. I don't know exactly. And that rate is going to be like 10% or 11%. So it's really a factor now of who can provide capital at what cost. It's not a matter of how much you give me, it's what can I get? And it's changed overnight, virtually overnight. And do you see it changing more and more every day? Every day, yeah. Because this is, I mean, it sounds like a lifetime already, but basically we're shut down for like a month, right? I mean, most people were in their offices March 1st, 2nd, 3rd, 4th, 5th, 6th, 7th, right? By the 13th of the month, the 15th of the month, you were home. 16th, 17th, whatever, right? It's only a month. It's only four weeks. And, and then two of those... You know, or we're Easter, Passover, people are doing what they're doing. Uh, it's going to change a lot more going forward. Yeah, it's, it's not getting back to where it was anytime soon in terms of leverage. And I think the, the high, levered, high levered providers certainly aren't coming back. And banks are going to be significantly more cautious um, going forward. And, and do you say that for every asset class or is there any specifically um, that they're, well, I guess it's the a, question. It's a, it's a, Across the board, meaning across the board. I'm, uh, across the board, certainly. So land lend there were there were a lot of lenders and land giving 70, 80 percent loans recently, and multifamily 80, 90 percent loans recently. Right? They're gone, right? So the hotel lenders are all gone. Every one of them has disappeared. Every hotel loan that's been made in the last year is probably in default at the moment. And I say it unfortunately because it is unfortunate, right? That this is happening, but they're all in default. So if you have a multifamily building, if you have an office building, uh, everyone's impact. If you sell land, everything is impacted at the moment. Everything is impacted. That's nice. Is there are there asset classes that got hit harder than others? The hotels are destroyed, and retail is a massive problem. 
and we'll, in, you know, multifamily I think is the least of the problems because at least there's a there's some rent collections across the board, right? So the main, I think in retail and hotel you could literally have zero collections, zero. Multifamily is not really zero yet. We have in our own buildings I've seen some collections are at 100% for April, some are at 50% for April, some are at 30% for April. Now, April's not over yet. And some checks probably really are lost in the mail at this point of the cycle, but uh, and because of forwarding of, eight of mail and whatnot. But if you have a piece of retail with seven tenants, you're probably at zero collection or maybe 10% collection. If you have a hotel and you're a hotel operator, I think I read a statistic where I think, I think occupancy is like a 4% or 10% or some minuscule number across the country. So yeah, those two are clearly taking it on the chin. Um, I think less so in multifamily for sure. If you have an industrial, a friend of mine's an industrial business and he just bought a property that a company was growing year over year in revenue by millions and millions of dollars. He bought their asset on the sale lease back. They were doing 25 million revenue. They're at zero in revenue overnight. So, which is just disheartening and, and certainly upsetting to hear, but uh, that's what it is, right? Unfortunately. Right. Yeah, yeah. So when do you see the capital markets get back to any sort of normalcy, po you know, pre-COVID? When do you see that happen? I, uh, I, I, yeah, good question. I don't know, and I don't think anytime soon. So I don't know exactly when, but it's not tomorrow, and it's not next month, it's not in the six, next six months. I, I hope and pray that this thing goes away and disappears tomorrow, but the, the banks are easier, it's easier to pull back than it's to go full steam ahead with banks and lenders generally speaking. And the high levered lenders can come back because they're trying to sell loans to pay off their credit lenders. So, and I hope they all do well. I hope everybody should do well, but uh, it, it's going to be a bit of time. I don't, I don't know exactly what time, but it's going to be a bit of time. Got it. And so, so how would you evaluate deals where, you know, what would you say to operators that had deals in the pipeline pre coronavirus, you know, pre coronavirus right. and, they were going to go in there with, like you said, 80 to 90 percent loans plus their their capital. And, um, you know, the rates were, you know, LIBOR plus three, 350. Um, really almost like you're at the top of the market and the lenders are really, really bullish at that point. What would you say to them on, you know, should they still move forward with their deals that they had in the pipeline as long as they're not, you know, non-refundable on their deposit? What would you say? to an operator that has, that's been having difficulties. And I'm sure you've spoken to many operators that who are, who are in the, you know, that situation, what would you say to them? Like, should they, you know, go to the seller and ask for some price adjustments or what would you say? So I've spoken to about 12 people in that same position over the last couple of weeks. Some are hard contracts, some not hard contracts, soft contracts, some are, are deal, looking at deals. Um, it depends on one's perspective, right? So if your deal, if anyone's deal is dependent on high levered financing but to impress their investors, I say you have a big problem, right? And to get out in a year or two, you got a big problem. I'd say if you're a 10 year investor, you have less of a problem, right? So personally on, on my end, on our end, when we're, when we're equity investors, as you know by now, uh, I'm not an aggressive guy, right? So me, I don't buy property with 80% financing, 90% financing. So to me, I, I, never, I never do it matter what, no matter what. Right. So, but if I'm going to buy something now and we were in the middle of, you know, or close enough to three different acquisitions that are now on pause. Right. But all those acquisitions are going to be 70% levered or less. Right. But the problem is they were five and a half to six caps with 65, 70% financing at three and a half percent. It kind of works. And it does work, particularly when you take 10 year money. Right. When you take 10 year money, it kind of works when you have upside in rent. Now the problem is, like I said before, we have some tenants in some buildings paying great for April, and some of the, some are paying terrible for April. Now, what's going to happen in May? I don't know, but I, for sure, if you have a ten-year horizon, I would still try to get a price reduction, where if possible. I just don't think, I just don't think the banks are going to be giving seventy to five percent or seventy percent of acquisition price. I think they're going to definitely look into the financial operating statements more. Um, and if you don't have those from the bar, from the seller, no one's getting a loan, right? I think they're really going to look deep into it as opposed to top of the market. Let's look at a piece of paper that says the income is a million dollars. Let's just give the loan out, right? So I, I think you need to lengthen your horizon 
get a reduction in price, have more equity in the deal, and that'll save the day. Because look, what's happening now, the fact that lenders are pulling back and equity dried up and, and banks are pulling back and rates are changing, that doesn't surprise me one bit. I've been waiting three years for this to happen, right? So for three years, I've been wrong, right? But the reason it's happening, I'm not happy it's happening, but the reason it's happening is quite disconcerting and upsetting that the virus has to come and, and certainly and kill people and ruin and shut down and shut down the economy, right? So six months ago, I would tell you crazy if this could ever happen in America. So the fact that it's the fact that we're in a position now where banks aren't aggressive and lenders are pulling back and rates are going up in the private space doesn't surprise me one bit. The reason it's happening is very surprising and quite honestly, you know, disheartening. But I think, in, but in time, they'll get better. But as you're buying something this minute, if you're trying to buy something this minute, I'm getting a better price. I'm not doing anything. I'd rather just lend money. You know, I'd rather just lend and be done with it, right? If you're in contract, if you're in contract, you have a little bit of a challenge, I think. If you're a long-term owner, you can get over those challenges. You'll have a short-term problem. If you must be out of something in three years with a high leverage bridge loan, I think it's a problem. I really do, unfortunately. I know that's that's great, great perspective. Um, so, are there any markets and and Elliot's in the hope oh, your screen disappeared again? Um, yeah, I got a I got a call from one of my partners. Let me just decline it. Hold on. Okay, am I back? Okay. <laughs> yeah, you're back. You're back. Uh, well, I, not too I much. Not, I was busy. Yeah, not too much longer back, anyway. Maybe. Yeah, not too much longer anyway. Um, so after you know the coronavirus dust you know, kind of settles and we don't really know when that's going to happen. It seems to be, you know, leveling off a little bit in the New York metro area, but nothing's really opening back up yet. Um, do you see the private lending space growing once things kind of start to stabilize? Or do you think that now is like a real opportunity to, um, you know, capitalize on, like you said, it's an unfortunate situation due to the virus. And we all knew there was a recession coming. We just didn't know, you know, when um, right. this kind of both hit two birds with one stone. Do you see right. that, you know, this is like the best opportunity for this type of money right now, or at least from your perspective on the lending side, as opposed to equity? Um, or, you know, do you think there's always a market for it, even in a you know. there's, there's, al there's always a market for it. I think it's a great time to be a low levered investor, debt investor. At the moment, you get better leverage, better rates, and that's always what I've wanted, right? So for me, if somebody tells me they got a $10 million property, they want $3 million, I'm excited, right? They want that same $10 million property, $8 million, I'm not excited, right? So I'm not excited. I don't want, in fact, I don't want to do it unless there's some significant value aid component that can take me out as a lender. Uh, but yeah, no, but there's, there's plenty of money out there for, for good borrowers with smart business plans that have good leverage or for people who need just some sort of liquidity event. And maybe they want a building for 40 years and it's worth 5 million bucks. And now it's worth three and a half million dollars. and You need a million dollars or something like that. But yeah, it's definitely a good time on that side. I think it's a good time to be an equity investor. Look, if somebody, you know, the converse thing is if somebody has to sell this moment for whatever reason, it's unfortunate, but they're going to take a, a beating, right? It is unfortunate because, you know, I know that position, it's a bad position to be in. But if someone has to sell this minute, uh, and there are will be people that have to sell for whatever the reason is, personal, financial, or whatever, um, they're going to take a beating. So the equity that can move on that will get themselves a really good deal. But that will be maybe the six-month or eight-month window. Some people think it will be a much longer window. It's, just, it's really an unknown, right? So if the building was, you know, $10 million in January and 10 guys would pay $10 million, you know, will one guy pay $10 million today or will five guys pay $8 million today or will 12 guys pay $7 million today, right? It's sort of an unknown because I don't see a lot trading right now, you know? Yeah. So, and what yeah. is trading is based on contract prices, I guess, call it performance pre-March for, for a better, uh, yeah. for a better um, understanding of things. Like we have a building in contract for sale, small building in Yonkers, and the guy's having a hard time getting a loan. So I told him I'd lend the money, right? So if I'm, <laughs> money, if I'm selling it and I'm buying and I can lend it on, I would hey, know the asset. Doing that, right? yeah. But I think there's definitely an opportunity for, for people with equity and, and longer term horizon to find deals and both, you know, both as being a debt investor and an equity investor. I think it's a good time for both. That's great. And, and like you said, we don't really know when the price correction is going to happen because like you said, there hasn't been many deals being brought to market during this time. Um, I'm wondering, and I'd love to get your opinion on this. Um, this is more on the uh, Fannie 
and Freddie's side through the agency lenders. So through a government backed program, um, you know, the forbearances and the the deferments and mortgages, do you think that, you know, that was a bad move by the Fed to allow that? Uh, Because I can see some owners not having enough reserves to pay that um, three months of, you know, principal interest taxes, insurance all in one hit if they don't have enough reserves. So do you think that at least for the multifamily side, that's going to create some distress? And if that was a good move at all by the Fed? So the answer is, I don't know yet, right? I think they have to do something. I think if you're, if you're telling people don't pay rent, you have to tell the banks you can't collect mortgage payment. But at the same token, what the agencies are doing, and I think what I read, I think I read it properly, is they're taking, they're giving you a three month forbearance, provided every month you provide certain financial documentation, et cetera, et cetera. And Fannie has some guidelines and Freddie has other guidelines. And, and then they're taking, and then month four, magically everyone's expecting things to be fine. In month four, they're gonna lop on you know, that three months of missed payment and, and then chop it up into 12 equal payments over the life of the loan. I don't think they're backending it. I think individual banks can do what they want. There's no real policy. Like I know some individual banks are putting it to the end of the loan. Some banks are saying, tough luck, pay me. Uh, you have an operating account, pay me. But the answer to the operating account is, I got to operate the building. If the boiler breaks, if the windows break, what do I want me to do? My building can't go into disrepair. So it becomes a problem. But I think the, the middle ground is, the middle ground is don't pay for three months, provide, provide you can't afford to pay. If you can afford to pay, you're paying your loan. End of discussion, right? If you can't afford to pay because it's, it's not covering, and or if you deplete your operating account, you put yourself in the worst situation, that's a problem. I, I think it's not so great necessarily. I mean, the ideal scenario would be to lop on three months of payment for the loan balance and, and, owe, it, and owe it on a refi or pay it off whenever you have the money. Ideally, that's the scenario. I think that works best. But what happens if month four, the collections are still bad? Like nobody knows, right? So I think they'll deal with it in month four. So if, 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 if May would theoretically be the first month of missed mortgage, May, June, July, is everything going to be perfect for August collection? Like, I hope so. I really do, right? But I don't know. So they have to do something. Something you, know, you, have to, you have to either go forward or move back. You can't stand still, right? So I think the, the middle ground is what they're trying to do is give you full bearance for three months, provided you need it, really need it, based on proven financials, and lop it on somewhere. You know, maybe the end is the best thing, but the agency are doing month four, payable over 12 installments. Got it. I actually didn't know about the installment plan, um, which has its pros and its cons, but your recommendation is if, if the operator can afford to pay and they have enough reserves, pay, because right. you don't want to, yeah, you don't want to be in a bad situation in a couple months. Yeah. Right. If you're collecting rent, pay, end of discussion. If you're not, you know, it is what it is. You have to do what you have to do. If you're collecting, pay. Right. I know some operators who um, are doing it on purpose. They're, they're, they're deferring it on purpose, but they no haven't doubt. gone through the paperwork. No yep. They haven't gone through the paperwork, like you just said. And um, I think it's a really poor decision um, just because you want to tax so they can pay distributions, which, you know, if you're not able to pay a distribution in the light of this, and actually, even if you are willing to, even if you can pay it, it might be smarter to just hold it off until this kind of settles a little bit more. Um, so yeah. I do know some operators, oh, I got to pay my distribution. I got to pay my distribution. You know, let me extend, you know, extend the mortgage payments or whatever. Uh, I just think it, I just think it's a whole funnel. In forbearance stuff, but in forbearance, you can't, with the, with the agencies anyway, in forbearance, you can't pay, take any money out. So it doesn't matter. So if you're full, if you're not paying your mortgage, you can pay your investors. They're not going to allow that to happen. Right. right. So they haven't the gone through it. So yep. maybe a bank, I don't know. Every, every bank's got their own way of doing things. I'm telling you the agencies won't, are going to be strict about that. And rightfully so, right? So, uh, it, but theoretically, if you don't have enough money to pay your mortgage, how do you have enough money to pay your investors anyway? And I love paying my investors. But number one priority is pay your bank, pay your investors, right? Absolutely. But, uh, some investors will be understanding and some won't. And some operators will try to take advantage, but it's not a good time. It's never a good time to take advantage of anything and certainly not now. Now just plug ahead, do the right thing and uh, we'll hope for the best. Absolutely. Well, great. So we're going to um, conclude this podcast and we usually conclude it, Elliot, with just three quick questions. So uh, first sure. one, first one being, uh, do you have a favorite real estate or business book? A favorite business book. Well, wow, that's a great, I've read so many. That's a great question. So um, uh, the title escapes me. Can I get back to it later? Like, I don't know. I, I read a lot of books. 
don't know that I have a favorite. One book I liked a lot, which was which was the deal about when when the Black Rock or Blackstone, whoever bought Stytown, that whole saga. I think it was called Other People's Money, maybe. I'm not sure. That was a very interesting saga of how they bought that building and did the deal and how it went sideways. And I felt that was pretty interesting. A uh, pretty interesting read. I don't I, maybe that's the name of the book. I don't remember, but uh, that was a pretty interesting read. Interesting. No, I never heard of that. Um, and then number two would be, uh, what are your hobbies outside of lending and, and real estate? My grandchildren. Those are my hobbies. My two, my two biggest hobbies are my grandchildren. And um, once upon a time, I was a basketball player. That's over. My career is definitely over. And uh, I, 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 I bike, I exercise. But my, my biggest hobby are my, my beautiful granddaughters. My best That's hobby. awesome. That's awesome. And then lastly, um, who would be, who would you say your role model has been throughout your, your life and your career? It's very easy. My dad, very simple, very easy. You know, awesome. He was a straight shooter. His word was good. And, uh, you know, we, we took my brother and I both learned a lot from that. Great. Great. So how can our listeners find you, Elliot? Reach out. Um, how can I reach out? Oh, okay. So my email, it's E L L I O T at hequities.com, Elliot at hequities.com. And if you want to call, 917-748-1955. Available 24-6, but not really 24-6, right? But always around, you know? Call, brainstorm, I'm always around. Great. Awesome. Well, thank you very much for listening to this episode of Discovering Multifamily. I'm your host. Thanks for uh, having me. Yeah, absolutely. I'm your host again, Anthony Scandariato. And um, all the... Links to contact Elliot is, are going to be in the description pages of the podcast. So you can, you know, find his number, find his email, et cetera, his LinkedIn page. I'll post that as well. Um, and thank you for joining us again. Really appreciate it. All right. Thanks for having me, Anthony. Good luck. We'll talk soon. Thanks so much. Right. Take care.